Excellent. It says we're live. Welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and we are live at five. So welcome, everybody. I'm super excited for you to join us. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and it's almost Father's Day. Yay. So like Mother's Day here at Pure Dog Talk, we're celebrating doggy style. So we're here to honor our do our stud dogs. <clears throat> we're going to talk about how we choose them to incorporate into our pedigrees, how we breed them wisely, how we preserve their genetics for the future, and all kinds of stuff. I'm being joined by my very special guest, Shannon Stone, my friend from ICSB NorCal. Shannon has all the information for you guys on frozen semen, particularly as it regards shipping semen internationally. Shannon is my guru. <clears throat> so while everybody's hopping on a couple items for the good of or the order, first and foremost, I'm so excited, you guys. Finally, thanks to Sandy MacArthur, our patron, Sandy MacArthur. We have a brand new swag store with some super, super cool merch available. If you're a patron, check it out. Discounts are built in. Second of all, tomorrow night, you can join Dr. Marty Greer and I on the Brilliant Pad sponsored webinar. What does your puppy's poop tell you? I have to tell you guys, tonight we're doing swimmers, tomorrow night we're doing poop. I mean, bodily functions week for the win, right? I'm like all about it. Um, next up, we have launched a very cool opportunity to access, access the archives in a new way. I've done all the searching, hunting, and pecking for you. So for the introductory price of only a buck ninety nine you can download an entire album of podcasts on specific topics sorted by topic, including things like breeding and whelping hands-on the interviews with some of our legendary members of the sport, veterinary voice, some of the owner handler interviews, love the breeds, all of our interviews on the breeds, so much more. Check it out. As always, you know, our success is your success. If you haven't yet, please do check out our exclusive patrons group. Your added perk is the pure pep talk, a weekly text message with an upbeat, fun, maybe educational little tidbit from the archives. You can sign up for the patrons group, join our patrons, get the pep talk messages for as little as $10 a month. I mean, y'all. That's the price of a of a foo foo coffee drink at your favorite stand for a month. <laughs> yeah. Bottom line, your passion is our purpose. Check it all out at the website puredogtalk.com. So now let's get this party started. Hey Shannon, how you doing? That's rock and roll. Rock and roll. Danny Canino, yeah. all the days. Yeah, that's okay. right. <laughs> so let's talk about our boy dogs. And I think that one of the most important things that we can talk about with our stud dogs is selecting the right stud dog for our brood bitch. So y'all that know Shannon as the semen collector may not know she's also an incredibly successful breeder in Pembroke Welsh Corgis. And so I, I think it's really important. Everybody needs to hear this concept. We've talked about it on the podcast. We've looked at it in, in a variety of different ways with a variety of different people. But choosing the right stud dog for your bitch is the single most important thing that you can do second only to starting with the best bitch you can get your hands on. So your stud dog should have complementary good qualities and not have the same faults that your bitch has. And let's all remember every single dog has faults. Okay. <laughs> Precious poopsie also has faults. Let's remember this. Yes, Shannon. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I've not seen <laughs> one walk on water yet. <laughs> no, I've had a few that I thought might, but no, they don't. 
<laughs> so going to going to your national, you know, meeting as many dogs in the breed as you possibly can, remembering that stud dogs from really, you know, male puppies, male dogs whose dams themselves are outstanding tend to produce the best right so if you see a really prepotent line of bitches that just continually 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 make these bitches constantly are making good quality offspring find a boy puppy from one of those and that's your next stud dog for what you're looking for don't you think agreed absolutely agreed yep Maternal and so, so is... that's part of it. Yeah. The damn line, because think about it, guys, all the X's do the X's and the Y's. There's more X's than there are Y's. We need the X's. <laughs> so that's, that's one of my favorites. Um, and yes, everybody out there, if you have questions, please do drop them in the comments. Natalie will forward them to Shannon and I. Hi, Carrie. How are you doing tonight? This is a great question, one that Shannon and I have talked about on the podcast, but Shannon, this is for you. What is the best oh, supplement is- for male to help with sperm count? All you, babe. This is an excellent one and one I love. So basically the best thing that we have found across the board, you're gonna think I'm crazy, diatomaceous earth, human food grade, always get human food grade um de we've seen it double and triple sperm counts within 90 days we've done a huge study on it amazing to me yeah it you know all we can say is it's a binding agent so it binds any toxins the males flushes it out it does not help abnormalities nor does it help motility but it will increase the sperm count so human food grade um if you want to know dosages in that because it's kind of all over the board for different breeds it goes by size they can drop me an email message me however but reach out and i can give them dosages on that and natalie's gonna drop you guys natalie's gonna drop in the comments for you um how to contact Shannon at ICSB NorCal. Um, it, talk to me. I know we have talked about this some. I know DE is one of the things you've said. Talk to me about green lipped muscle. I know it's another one you've used. Green lipped muscle um, works great for motility. Motility is one of the hardest things to figure out in stud dogs. Why sometimes, you know, they have great motility, other times you can collect them with day, within days. One day they're good. Monday, they're good. Tuesday, they're bad. Um, You know, there's so many factors that play into that. Um, Is, you know, is it hot? Is it too cold? Um, I mean, there's just, and there's really no rhyme or reason to it. Green lipped muscle. Yeah, green lipped muscle um, is excellent for motility. Most like we sell and recommend the ICSB, the CF plus and CF plus advanced. Mm-hmm. I mean, it obviously has multiple ingredients, but the green lift muscle is the, the active ingredient that you always want to make sure you're feeding to the boys. Um, that is the motility, the swimmers for motility. It's their best friend. So excellent. So yeah have more of them swim faster love it (laughs) so you know the the green lift muscle the de those are your two primary supplements that we recommend across the board um you know obviously some studs are going to have if they have specific issues you can address those but for just general basic semen quality um preservation i guess is the best word um management mm-hmm. those two right definitely perfect yep and marissa hey marissa i see you out there uh marissa armstrong wants to know the best way to preserve fertility in older dogs mm, good question <clears throat> because mm-hmm. dogs are just like people as we get older our reproduction mm-hmm. decreases so yep. um you know 
recommendation, start young, collect young and frequently. But we yes. do have our older boys. Um, the supplements that I just mentioned are paramount. Um, heat. Heat is not a friend of any type of sperm. So keep your boys cool. Um, if you have, and I know Marissa has a coated breed. Um, yes. You know, be very careful when you're using a force air drying them. Um, protect those testicles. You know, I say cup them, turn your yes. blower on cool, you know, anything you need to do. Um, I had a male that used to like to sunbathe on the cement and he would lay, you know, splayed out. Mm -hmm. And um, his semen quality decreased greatly because of the heat. So well, don't cool. cook them, don't freeze them, right? These are the two uh, big ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no extremes. <laughs> yeah. Everything at like 65, 70 degrees, we're good, man. Come in That's the Northwest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Temperate zone for the boys and the jewels. Yep. Okay, yep. I love it. I love it. Okay, so you mentioned earlier, and I think this is so critical, and I'm going to speak from personal experience here. Um, collect early, collect often. Um, I had a yep. young stud dog that I collected at, um, I don't know, he wasn't even like maybe 13 months old, something like that. Mm -hmm. I was sending him off to the field trainer in Nevada where they have rattlesnakes, you know, like I just had bad visions. <laughs> and so I just did a collection on yeah. him just randomly, just like, just in case no health testing done, no nothing. I knew he was a nice young dog, but that's what, that's all I knew. And I, mm -hmm. and I just did that. And then I just never really thought about it again because he was alive and he was kicking and he was, you know, he'd had a couple litters. He was doing great. Never crossed my mind. I'm like, yeah, I probably ought to get around to getting him collected again. Yeah. He was dead at seven. <clears throat> yep. So um, we, may I suggest collect early, collect often, do your DNA at the time of the initial collection. That's another one. Yeah. I had to, I had to pull up a piece of his D of his frozen semen to get DNA for a litter that was bred before he died. But after he was dead, they were born and, um, yeah, it was awful. Yeah, no, it is um, highly recommended. You know, we don't recommend starting collections until they're around 11 months old. Some breeds, sex, you know, mature sexually a lot faster than, right. you know, right. toy breeds, non-sporting breeds typically are a little slower maturing. But as long as they're exhibiting sexual behaviors, lifting their leg, you know, interested in girls, mm -hmm. you're probably okay to start collecting. Mm -hmm. So. And do you find, I mean, it's been my experience, but you've got vastly more than I do. Your experience that younger stud dogs have better looking, more motility, more viable semen, just more of it. Yes and no. Um, typically it takes one or two collections to, you know, mm -hmm. it's a psychological thing. So, you know, right. um, if, if they come in gangbusters, you know, yeah, you'll get a good collection. If they're a little more timid. Sometimes it takes a collection or two to get the best numbers. Um, quality in younger males is typically much better. You know, you're not fighting that defect load. Um, and, you know, across the board, I say two years to depending on the breed, you know, seven, six, seven mm -hmm. are like prime. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, you always have your abnormal ones that come in at 11 and they look like they're two years old, right. but yeah. Right. That's, that's not the norm. Um, no. And <laughs> I think <laughs> it's not the norm. Um, the other thing I think is really important is to, uh, habituate the dog to the concept of having their special place touched, right? <laughs> because this can be, this can be a challenge. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, so many people, we see these males come in here and they'll sniff our teaser bitch. 
And then they'll kind of look at their owner like, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. And, you know, the owner will immediately, if they like go to hike their leg or something, they'll yell no. And in our lab and our tent at a mobile lab, we never use that word. N-O is not allowed. Um, you know, so if you have males in your house, in your kennel, don't ever tell them no when they're exhibiting that behavior. If it's obnoxious, just kind of move them in a different direction, you know, um, because think about it. If they're reprimanded for exhibiting that desire, when you come time to collect them, they're going to go, no, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> right. um, and, do, you know, put them on a table, stack them. You know, they're used to their testicles being touched, but a lot of times the penis is a big turnoff. So it's okay. <laughs> It's okay to touch your man parts. It's okay. Yep. And I think I think that I think that's hard for a lot of particularly new folks to get used to it. They're like, "Ew, you know, boy parts, boy germs." Like, yeah. It they have to they if they're going to be involved in a breeding program, if they're going to be used as a stud dog, they're going to have to be touched in their special spot. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. And you don't have to go full blown, you know, just touch them so they get used to yep. be in touch and you know yep. not want to bite yep. or <laughs> yep um and so i know you and i have talked about this before and and there may be some of this that people need to follow up with you privately but th the importance of testing your dogs in diff in in a media right? If ICSB media yeah. works for your dog, it's really important to know that. And if it doesn't, it's equally important to know that. Absolutely. You know, semen is just like, it's an individual, you know, it's individual, you know, just like mm -hmm. people. Some people are allergic to certain things. Some people, you know, don't like certain things. It's the same thing with semen. Um, the one nice thing about ICSB Media, and that's why, you know, Sydney and I, when we opened this, we did our research. Across right. the board, you know, most dogs freeze and chill very well in ICSB Media. It has a right. lot of great buffers in it that protects the semen. So, um, but yeah, definitely. You don't want to have a bitch owner call you and say, I need a shipment. And you collect the dogs, they spend hundreds of dollars to get it there, and it's dead. Just because so you bad. Didn't know to ship your dog in. You right. know, so definitely contact your repro vet, wherever you're getting your collections done. It behooves you as a stud owner to do a chill test on your dog. Most vets have 100%. access to four, yeah, four or five different medias. They'll do the collection, they'll put it in each media, and they'll usually look at it for about a week. Um, mm -hmm. Then when it comes time, you know what that dog, and it's not always just the first day motility. You know, sometimes the shipments get delayed. You want to know the, lo the longevity. Right, so, 100%. Very, so very good. Anybody, anybody with extra questions on that, by all means, we've dropped um, Shannon's contact information here in the comments follow up on that because that is super important. Um, and I've got another question from Carrie and this is a great one. I think it's a really common one. Um, she, Carrie wants to know what's more successful AI with surgical fresh chilled insemination or a side by side. I will tell you my personal lived experience. I have had clumber spaniels before I had anything else. Side by side was the way you brought a dog. <laughs> It's like the only yep. way you run a dog. Um, just basically. Um, I have done a variety of fresh chilled and, and surgical AI. And I will tell you personally, it's 100% my personal experience. Shannon will have a broader base for that. I have the best success. My most numerical percentage success is with surgical AI. I have tremendous success with that. Shannon, what's your thought on it? <laughs> this opens a can of worms. <laughs> yeah. um, See, I'm going to yeah. get you in trouble no matter what I do, right? <laughs> Throw that one out there. Um, okay. 
side by side versus just AI or surgical is what we're talking about here. No trans cervical involved. Correct? Um, trans cervical is something that I need. I think needs to be discussed. It wasn't in the question, yes. but that is another a, another modation modality okay. well, that we need yep. to talk about. So, so recently, the um, Theorio societies, the Society of Theorio Genealogists. Um, have determined that TCIs have better success than surgicals. And here's the reason why. You're putting the semen in the same place, but surgicals, you have a greater risk of, I mean, you're anesthetizing your bitch. You're cutting right. her open. You have yep. surgical site infections. You know, it's a higher stress load on your bitch. You know, typically TCIs, you're, the owner is in the room with the bitch, you know, patting her head, talking, cuckooing her. Um, you're in, you're out. You know, there's no surgical sites. There's no anesthesia. Um, you know, they've done studies where they've inserted dye in the semen and tracked it. Mm -hmm. Within 15 seconds, that semen is at both horns, um, mm -hmm. you know, going where it needs to go. Now, with that said, and I mean, I think a lot of, I know like our facility, we're at a 97% success rate with frozen semen and TCIs. So um, sometimes a surgical is necessary. You know, if you don't have a, a vet or, you know, around that can do TCIs, yeah, you know, surgicals are the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes you see bitches that you just can't, it's not humanly possible to pass a catheter. You know, mm -hmm. um, I've seen cavaliers, their cervix is backwards. So, you know, yeah, you're gonna go to a surgical. So mm -hmm. if you've had a bitch that has missed a couple times for no reason, good semen, good progesterone timing, um, do a surgical, find out, mm -hmm. is there, you know, cysts in that uterus, what's going on? Right. That's an right. excellent. You know, and that's one thing that the surgicals, it's, it's an excellent opportunity. Yeah, definitely poking around in the uterus when, when you have something yeah. that's a problem, I, yeah. I think is a hundred percent. I just, I mean, my personal experience is having missed with 9 million fresh chilled vaginal inseminations. I'm like, no, just send me frozen and I will have someone drop it in there. And a sort well, of small surgery, but that's me. So that's why I asked you because you do a lot more of this. Well, and how many times have we all done a side-by-side -side AI? We hold the bitch up for 20 minutes, you know, and they think we're crazy. And then you set her down and gravity takes effect. And there goes half the semen out, you know, and it's like, okay. <laughs> so at least with whether it's a surgical or a TCI, you're getting the semen in the uterus. It's not coming out. So yep. Yep. that's my two cents. Okay. I like it. I like it. It's good. Um, okay. So now the big question and one of, one of the many reasons I brought you besides I love you and I wanted to see your smiling face. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you are pretty much my go-to guru on shipping semen internationally. Can you give us just kind of some, you know, top three or top five really basic tips about how to ship semen internationally, frozen, obviously, yep. most successfully? Yep. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Good. Call <laughs> Shannon because that's the right answer. Because my understanding from our previous conversations is every single country has different paperwork, different requirements, different everything. Basically, yes. So Australia and New Zealand, um, they're probably one of the most, I'm not going to say difficult, I'll say complicated. There's right. um, a lengthy, you know, you do semen collections, you have to wait some 30 to 45 days, then you have blood testing to do. So it's a process. And I would say if you're even considering thinking of possibly exporting, you have a stud dog that seems to be pretty popular, you know, plan ahead. 
you know, talk to your collection center and say, hey, you know, we may want to, you know, ship this dog. Um, mm -hmm. You can draw blood. A lot of times that blood, you know, if you draw it in the proper time frame, the serum can be frozen um, or you can mm -hmm. send out and do the testing. Um, you know, plan ahead. Don't freak and out. And they're doing and rabies ahead. titers, right, Shannon? That's what they're doing is rabies titers? No, typically, no. Mm -hmm. There's really not many countries that even require rabies anymore. Um, oh, UK yeah. is one of them. Um, mm -hmm. But no, it's typically tests like brucella, lepto. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Australia has a very country specific test they do. It just depends on the country. Um, okay. But yeah, you know, before you start, don't jump the gun. Don't go on USDA and try to figure it all out yourself because it's going to be a mess. Contact your exporting company, whether it's me or, you know, whoever. Um, contact them. They'll give you a, a total checklist, step by step of the process, whatever country it is. Um, the European countries are typically easy, like Germany. Um, you know, if you send SEMA to Germany, you can almost get it anywhere in the EU countries. So that's nice. Um, Very but cool. same thing, you know, collect, collect your dogs young. You know, those mm -hmm. people, it's a huge cost for them to export semen. And so you want to make sure you're sending them quality semen and make sure right. you are getting quality semen. You know, freezing is just like um, chilling. You know, mm -hmm. some centers freeze, like we freeze in pellets. It's stored mm -hmm. in vials. Right. Um, some centers, you know, Zoetis or whatever, they freeze in straws. Some dogs freeze better in pellets versus straws. It, so it's not just a one size fits all. So you really need yeah. to do your research there. Don't get discouraged. If you freeze your dog in straws and it's like, oh, that was a disaster, try another method. You know, because sometimes okay. it, it helps. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, that's fabulous feedback. And Marissa um, just wanted to give you a shout out. She says she's done two frozen breedings with a single TCI following your protocol in our previous podcast, and they've both worked. And she's hoping for number three soon. So, woo woo. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So back to stud dog shopping. So we've done kind of the mechanics of, of the stuff. Um, back to the concept of a stud dog. And I think one of the things that is talked about a lot and, and not enough people hear it <laughs> is the concept of popular sire syndrome in our breeds and breeding yourself into a corner. Right. And so, you know, this dog has 28 billion zillion bagillion best in shows, and therefore I must breed to him. Whether he has all the same faults, whether it's a complete outcross, whether it's a God forsaken, nobody's ever going to make a nick out of this, doesn't matter. It's got all the best in shows, so let's breed to it. Yep. Along with 58,000 other people. Yeah, <laughs> on this. it makes my eyes bug out of my head. But you tell me what you think. <laughs> um, I'm on the same page with you. You know, I've seen it in my breed a lot recently. You know, there was a couple very popular stud dogs. And you could literally go to any specialty across the country and watch the progeny walk in the ring and know who these were sired by not in a good way you know yeah. they really were pre predominant in some very bad head faults in our breed mm. and it, you know and it's funny because our head is not people don't say well it's not a head breed like a collie you know but they're also herding dogs you know they're supposed to have a very specific stop a very specific shaped mm -hmm. eye and the way it's set and if you're having well these, and like, it's a pembroke how do you tell it from a cardigan part of it is the head, head. <laughs> type yeah. of the thing you know yeah you know we see it so much across the board it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what breed it is whoever's winning we've got to breed to it you know yeah. um 
and going back to frozen semen. That's the mm -hmm. the benefit of that. You know, I personally mm -hmm. just did a breeding. Um, my mom and I, we, that dog, he's been dead since 1992, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, we got a litter of eight puppies. But we went back because we needed to strengthen our hip line. You know, we were losing our good hips. We were losing um, good eye shape. And, you know, you kind of have to look at, when I look at my bitches, I'm sure you have your opinion on that. I look at them and I say, what two things do I want to, do I need to change? If I really need to start looking at more than two things, I say, do I need to really breed this bitch? You know, because there you no, go. Dog is, no, no dog is going to fix everything. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So, yeah, you know, you got to breed to the individual. Right. And I feel really strongly about not just, you know, I'm willing to outcross. I've had to do a couple in the last couple of years that were like more than I wanted to do, but you need to do yeah. it every now and then. Absolutely. Right. Yep. But, but my favorite, when I can find it, is to find a dog that is an outcross, but is line bred itself. So that yep. I can consistently find those characteristics I'm trying to get from that dog. But I, yep. I don't know about y'all, but in my breed, that is, that's a challenge. And, and finding one that's line breed bred on something I want it line bred on. Um, and so those are, those are the kinds of things that people need to be researching, thinking about, looking at pedigrees, looking at going to the national or going to specialties or going and seeing as many dogs as you can live because temperament is a thing. And I know that we think that 90% of our temperament comes from our bitches, but I'm not 100% on that, to be honest with you. I, I really think there's a lot that comes from our stud dogs, from the sire line that has to do with character, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I agree. You know, and, when you start and using so frozen thinking semen, about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you can use frozen semen and see personality traits coming through that you noticed in those stud dogs 30 years ago. Okay. <laughs> it's Actually, a real thing. <laughs> it's not from the bitch. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, no, I think, and I think that's right. You know, and I think I'm a pre, I'm, I'm totally into line breeding as you are. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the only way that you can set type in your breeding program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think when people, it's very easy to breed one generation. It takes a true breeder to breed two generations on. You have to study your pedigrees. You have to you know, look for those specific things and you can't just do the mm -hmm. flavor of the month, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I love, like you said, I love studying pedigrees, going to a specialty and finding a dog that was fourth or sixth in his class or whatever, right. you know, and right. go, I want to breed. <laughs> that dog, that dog right there. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I just said it the other day, I was kind of randomly scrolling through social media and this dog popped up. I'm like, ah, 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 ah. Tell, where'd that come from? <laughs> you know? yeah. And and I think that that is, as breeders, part of what we should be doing is is that kind of stud dog shopping. But now let's flip it around and say, I own stud dogs. Like, how do I make decisions about how my stud dog is bred? You know, do I do I turn down? Um, a breeding on my dog because he's had three or four others and I want to kind of sit and let the, you know, those kinds of decision making are so important when you Absolutely. are a stud dog owner. Well, yeah, because you know who they're going to point to. It's not their bitch. <laughs> always. It's always the Never their bitch. Always. <laughs> always. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always and forever. Um, Everything that's ever wrong is the stud dog's fault. So just keep that in mind, y'all. Yeah. yeah. You know, kind of rule of thumb what my mom and I do with our dogs. Like we have a young dog now and we mm -hmm. did three test breedings on him. Yes. One yeah. was 
kind of line bred on his mother's side. Mm -hmm. The other was line bred on his sire's side. And then one was kind of an outcross. And mm -hmm. we really wanted to see, you know, across the board what he was going to produce. And mm -hmm. you hope with these line bred dogs that it's consistent. You know, sometimes it's consistently bad, <laughs> but, you know. There are those days too. Um, yeah. You know, and I did the same thing. You know, that, that dog I was telling you, I was talking about earlier, the Bing dog that just, that I just lost. I, that's exactly what I did. Like I really wanted to test him. I did a complete outcross. Yeah. Like the bitch was from Russia. Literally there was nothing the same yeah. in the founders. And then I did my first and only so far, um, half brother, half sister. I did a complete inbreeding oh, and I yeah. really wanted to test him to see how he carried forward. And it was mm -hmm. so useful to, to see what came through, what didn't come through, you know, what held up, what didn't hold up on the outcross, what, what got solidified in the inbreeding. I had a line breeding plan for him that we're not going to get to do, but, um, you know, it's, it's, there's lots of things, um, that come into consideration when we have our own stud dogs, whether it's collecting them early, health testing them, doing the full panel, like you might in your brood bitch be willing to say, well, I'm going to do an auscultation instead of an echo, you know, whatever, yeah. right? In your heart, yeah. your stud dogs. Oh no, honey, you're doing the whole thing, right? Because yeah. they have so much potential to have so much more outsized impact based on the number of puppies they can actually produce in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think too, you know, getting away from just the physical, the physical part of owning a stud dog. If you have a young dog that has some potential, you also need to think about the things. Am I going to ship semen out of the country? Because I'm going to tell you, once it's out of the country, you have no control. None. I don't care what people say to you, you have no control. So, you know, that's something to think about. How, what is your stance on that? You know, am I going to sell put, let, if some, if you bred to one of my dogs, am I going to let you sell some of those puppies out of the country? You know, you okay. have to really address because our world has gotten so small. We can mm -hmm. ship semen, we can ship dogs, you know, we can do mm -hmm. so much that those are things that we have to address now that we didn't years ago. Well, and here's a really good riff, Shannon, having just kind of been around the circle on this one. Let's you and I chit chat about the concept of being a stud dog owner and stud dog contracts. Ooh. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, baby. So, um, yeah, the, I think a really important thing that, that is old school for people like you and I, we are not the breeder of this litter. Yeah. I am selling you some swimmers. I am not in charge. I will ask that you not sell them at retail, you know, stuff like that. I'd like yeah. to know where they wind up. That's about, you know, for me as an old school person. And we have seen in recent years sort of the onset of the helicopter micromanager stud dog owner who feels like they have just as much say in your litter as you do. Yeah. Talk, talk, talk to me about that. You deal with a, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't deal with a lot of stud contracts, but mm -hmm. I have experienced it, you know, firsthand, just that, you know, um, it's not just one generation, it's generational, you know, where these, you have generations of these puppies that you're not allowed to do certain things with. Um, I had a bitch I wanted to breed to a very nice male. And literally, it was such a controlling contract that I couldn't even place one of these puppies with my son as on a co-ownership. Mm -hmm. If it didn't re live in my household and with just me, it had to be on a spay neuter contract, which all my pets are anyway. But yeah, I, yeah. Ooh, ooh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
you want to see Auntie Laura's back go straight up <laughs> and and lock into place and and um, perhaps assure someone that I would rather the breed die than breed to your stud dog that you think is worth twice as much money and you're going to tell me what to do with my puppies. No, yeah. I do. So um, the importance of being responsible while not mm -hmm. being, <clears throat> how would we think of that? A control freak? Controlling, with your yeah. 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 Speak yeah. to that. Well, you know, the way I look at it is if somebody approaches me about using our study, which I'm going to just preface that with, we don't stand a lot of our studs publicly right. anymore. You know, right. I, I, I just don't, it's yeah. a pain, <laughs> but yes, it is. if somebody approaches us, you know, if they're an ethical person and they've mm -hmm. done all their health testing and I mean, typically they're a member of at least a regional, you know, club, if not the parent mm -hmm. club, you mm -hmm. know, you gotta give these people a chance. We can't be so closed minded. I mean, I look at the dog shows and the breed, you know, we're in trouble. We need yeah. to mentor these people. And, you know, <laughs> if I think they're ethical enough, who am I to, you know, be a ethics police for their litter? You know, mm -hmm. I'm agreeing to use that they're going to do the best by the puppies that, you mm -hmm. know, we agreed upon and go flourish. <laughs> well, and you know, be available as a resource. Hey, I can, Absolutely. you know, need anything, ask me, you know, yeah. I might have somebody interested, blah, blah, blah. It's a, it's a whole different concept to be a resource, to be available, to offer a helping hand as it is to be yeah. thou shalt and thou shalt not. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, Doug Johnson wrote a thing not too long ago that was so, um, important. And I, and I shared it with people at the time and you denying your super important, special who daddy, who daddy, who daddy dog to someone with a bitch that is maybe not who daddy, who daddy, who daddy isn't yeah. solving anything. It's not no. improving the breed. It's not making the breed move forward. And if your nope. focus is you and not the breed, then probably you and I are not going to be best friends. I mean, that's just possible. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I agree. And that's just me. I mean, that's just me. I don't know. Speak to, speak to your thoughts on that, Shannon. Well, no. And I mean, you know, you see these breeds and I mean, Doug comes from a breed that, you know, there's not a lot of numbers, you know, no, but no, there's not, I came from know, it too. And I, and I think a lot of our breeds are getting to that point. And if we are so close minded that, you know, we walk on water and our dogs can't be used on, you know, little Mary Jane's Fifi over there, you know, pretty soon our breed is going to start suffering along with every other breed. You know, you got to step out of your box and we all started somewhere. Somebody yes. always, that one person took a chance on us, you know, and and we and i i want to be sure that people don't misunderstand me i'm not saying park your dog on a street corner with a sign that says free hoo-ha right exactly I, yeah. there's, there's a real difference here between responsible ownership yep. of a stud dog and micromanaging the availability yep. of a dog that could help improve a bitch in some particular way just because they don't meet your personal approval. Yeah. And kind of on a little side note, I think you, when you, you look at your, your developing your stud contract, you also have to determine, are we talking about fresh chilled shipments, you know, mm -hmm. live covers versus frozen mm -hmm. semen? Those are two different things, you know, because yes, sometimes, as you know, you have frozen semen that's, on dogs nobody else is going to get it no yeah no, exactly no. <laughs> or, or if you want to see a control freak if i sell frozen semen on my dogs that i no longer have you're going to do that breeding 
exactly as I would do it, or you don't get to use it. Exactly. So, I just, I won't, I mean, I've got a couple dead dogs that I have between the two of them, maybe three and a half breedings on. No, no, that's not available. Yeah. And that, no, that's, and that's, yeah. that's fair. And I don't have any problem with that. Um, I, I, I think that that is, that is, you know, the stud dog owner's absolute right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and I, I will honestly, this is a, this is a moment for anti Laura honesty my thoughts on this have changed over time, right? When I was a baby dog breeder, I was, I was like, no, nobody, you have to have this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And this. No, you are definitely not good enough for my Henry, whatever it was. Um, yeah. I mean, I still have, I still have some basic stuff. Like you have to have X, Y, and Z. But I, I've come a long way in my thinking, and I think that's an important thing to understand as we start out and as we move forward, that it's okay to evolve how we think about things as we learn more. I tell my kids every day, as long as you're green, you'll grow. You get ripe and you rot. You know, you got to keep an you. open mind. God, I love you. <laughs> You know, it's true. You know, I think you can learn something every day from, you know, it may be nine negative things that that person says, but there's going to be one positive that you can take from it. And it could change. And even the negative way. things, you can learn from that. You can always learn what not to do. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, um, you know, breeding dogs is not for the faint of heart, as you know. You know, and I think that as a breeder, I've bred, you know, I've looked at this pedigree on paper and I've thought, this is the litter. This one is going to be it. And when they're born and do not keep something just because you did that breeding, you know, look, don't be kennel blind. Look at that litter and say, did I get what I did bred this litter for? And if you can say, nope, then sell them all as pets. You know, you're not benefiting I, yourself or the uh, breed. I swear to you, I did. I think back to the to this one particular litter on paper. It was, I mean, be still my little <laughs> tactical heart. Right? Yep. Like, like, like dual champions all the way back and some of the best dogs in the history of the breed. And oh, my God. God, it was going to be amazing. You know what it was? <laughs> it was a disaster. It was six horrendously mismarked puppies. Like, oh, yeah. heinously. Like, in wire hair pointers, no solid liver on the head. Anywhere. It was like, terrifying. Uh, yeah. and, and I learned a really big lesson. I had planned to name that litter after superheroes and they were then named after supervillains. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I learned really freaking fast how not to use that particular stud dog or that particular brood bitch. You know, Laura, that brings up something that is <sighs> so near and dear to my heart is if you want a stud dog, be honest to your, with yourself and with people that contact you about the good, bad, and the ugly. You yep. know, if that dog produces head white, tell them this yep. dog can produce head white. You know, there's nothing worse than spending thousands on a breeding. Head white and, and Pembroke Welsh Corgi is different than absolutely no liver and a wire hair pointer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, We've all done that breeding where we've used a stud and you see these puppies and it's like, where did that come from? And you contact the owner of the stud dog and they're like, I don't know. I've never seen that before. <laughs> you know, so don't lie to yourself and full disclosure, you know, let them make the choice. If they want to take the chance and breed to him, that's fine. You know, but yeah. be honest. Yeah, it. Uh, I think that that honesty is the best policy. It takes on so much more meaning when you're a stud dog owner 
I I just can't even like I can't even or when uh, you're not you know you have a stud dog and someone comes to you and you're like no really I promise you breeding him to that bitch would be the worst mistake of your life I won't let you do that (laughs) and that's a thing even a great dog there are lines that do not nick they just don't work you know it i know it any experienced breeder knows it and that is part of your job as an experienced breeder is to share that knowledge with the people that are out there absolutely absolutely and you know all right breed to your standard don't rewrite the standard to fit what you're breeding breed to your standard it's been written it's been there for years and years it was written for a reason you know um breed to the standard not to the ribbon exactly you know in my breed you know your breed has its breed characteristics for a reason my breed Mm -hmm. you know they don't have a lot of head white because most farmers that used my little brown farming you know herding dog knew that if they had head white, they were going to get cancer. They were going to have, a, you know, a whole lot of slew of things. So, you know, that standard is there for a reason. And use Amazing. It. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah, no, it's the standards there for a reason. Okay. Um, so Shannon and I have been just jabbering our jaws. Anybody yeah. out there with questions? <laughs> because this is what happens when good friends get together. We just jabber. Uh, Natalie, do we have any questions in our audience? Anybody out there? Nope, nope. Okay, very good. Any passing? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, Any final words of wisdom from you, my friend? Oh, gosh. Besides Um, breed to the standard and not the ribbons. That's that's, that's pretty solid advice right there. Yeah. Um, you know, you said it, you nailed it, you know, collect young, collect often when it comes to semen, you know, do the DNA when you collect in the first time, please learn learn from my experience, you guys, that was, that was hideous. You know, chilled shipments, do a chill test on your stud dogs. Mm -hmm. It's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit your bitch owners. I I got one. I promise you. (laughs) Are you there, Shannon? Okay, we both blanked at the same time on the the stream. So, So Shannon and I were talking about this before we came on air, you guys. I promise you. I promise you. If you have a stud dog and the brood bitch owner says, I'm doing the progesterone testing and it could be one of these two days, whichever day is the most inconvenient the most impossible for you to get your stud dog collected that That's that will definitely be the day yep yep <laughs> yep um be prepared yeah and find know what vets around you can do collections if it's a vet if it's a just a repro center if it's an icsb center whatever no you know, know where you're going to go. <laughs> and are they open on a Saturday, you know, can or they- a Sunday? Okay. Or- yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. A couple of quick questions. Um, yearly semen check on the boys. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I would even yeah. recommend, you know, maybe twice a year, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of things can happen in six months. Um, if you're going to do it, if Depends. you know, you're going to have on your breed. Breed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And if you know you've got a breeding planned or somebody wants to use your dog coming up, go get an eval mm-hmm. done. Make sure mm-hmm. you know what you're dealing with. You know, no bitch owner wants to go in there thinking their bitch is getting bred on that day. And uh oh, surprise, there's mm-hmm. no semen. What's, what's your plan B? You know, yeah. so. Yeah, and they're done that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually brought a stud dog home from the national to breed to a bitch that was in season got here and couldn't get a breeding had my vet come to do a side by side she looks at the at the tube she's like there's nothing in here I'm yeah. like what 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 <laughs> so 
So, um, how often should you should the stud dog owners be requiring a Bruce Lewis's test? I, I think every six months that you say, what yep, do you say? That's exactly what we do every six months. Um, you know, brucellosis is not just a sexually transmitted disease. If you take your dog, walk into a dog park and they, you know, or a dog show a dog or a, anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, they can get it. So, and it's out mm -hmm. there now it's, you know, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. The foreign yeah, rescue time. imports have brought us lots of wonderful, wonderful treats. Yeah. And just a little FYI, freezing semen does not kill brucellosis. Oh, so, that's a tiny no, bit. It yep. It does kill other some other things, but it does not kill brucella. So. Fabulous. I'm reading um, it you're reading it too. Okay. Uh, yeah. stud dog owner, limit the number of times you have used and how do you determine that number? This is a great question. We sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier. I'll let Shannon speak her piece. I personally think that particularly for a young dog, five is a really good number, particularly in the large number breeds like mine. I mean, my dog can sire, um, 50 puppies in that that's a lot of impact on a numerically small number breed. So that's me, Shannon, your thoughts. That's a hard one because you're right. You know, a stud dog can have such an impact negative or positive on a, on a breed across the board. Um, you know, I think as a breeder, when you do those test breedings, you need to be honest with yourself. Like I've seen in my breed, you know, that one or two dogs that was so prominent across the board ruined, I mean, just put dominant head faults in our breed that we're now trying to deal with as in a breed as a whole. You know, I would say, and like when I do my collections on my own males, I do, I usually collect enough to breed 10, you know, do 10 breedings. To me, 10 to 15 breedings, that's, that's enough. You know, that's yeah, a but you're in, a, you're in a breed that has five or six puppies, not 12. We're very, yeah, exactly. We're in a smaller breed. And I think that's something right. to look at. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yep. but, so, um, you know, and there, there lies the crux of it though. Are you in it to better the breed? Or are you in it just for the stud fee? You yeah. know, that's where yep. you have to draw the line. So, yep. And I think, you know, realistically look at the number of puppies in an average litter, <clears throat> look at the number of dogs in your breed and, and make some, make some decisions about that. Right. Yeah. Um, mine is not a big number breed and 50 puppy. I mean, I won't breed my bitches more than three times. So, you know, um, I, I, I know plenty of people who've bred dogs way many more times than that. Um, I'm not going to say never, never, never. I'm just saying that at five, start really thinking hard about it and thinking yeah. about, do you want to go in a direction? Did you, you already saw it didn't work this way. Don't breed any more bitches in that direction. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, and I want to see puppies as a result of my stud dog that benefit the breed. I don't just want to see a whole class full of puppies by my stud dog. You know, mm -hmm. I'd rather see one good one out there that you can appreciate versus 10 that you're going, okay, you know, so. What was the point yeah. of that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so is that in a year overall? I'm saying overall. Um, overall, yeah. Yeah, overall. overall. I There's you know, and it may be that you, you know, the dog's bred five times and he's five or six years old. And you're like, okay, let's stop and look at how these puppies are growing up. Let's get some of these puppies to be two years old or three years old. If you're in a breed in which epilepsy is a thing, you should bloody well be waiting exactly. until the first couple of litters are like four exactly. and five before yeah. you're breeding your dog again. Right. So taking a global um, perspective, I think, to how we incorporate our stud dogs and our breed bitches, but we're talking stud dogs, how we incorporate them, 
with the understanding and awareness and knowledge that they can just numerically have such a ridiculously huge and outsized impact on the entire breed. Exactly. And that's the, what's the benefit of frozen semen. You can collect these dogs and yep. store it. And like, yep. personally, you know, I just went back to a dog that he wasn't used a lot, but I mm -hmm. went back to him. I knew what he produced. So right. I went back to him for a specific reason. And, you know, so yeah, mm -hmm. you breed your dog, you know, five, 10 times, whatever, you know what then he's producing. You've got frozen on him in yep. 10 years from now, if you're lacking that in that breed, go back and use it, you know? So yeah, don't overuse them. Doesn't yeah, benefit I, it's just <laughs> guard, safeguard your breed. Yep. Worry more about the breed as a whole than your own or your dog's oh, legacy. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, I cannot emphasize enough and I know it is not a, um, like a popular opinion. Um, but being, being more concerned for the breed that you love than for your own self aggrandizement is always going to be yep. the right answer. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. I agree. I, you know, more people need to think that way. God bless you. Well, that's why we're friends, Shannon. Um, at any rate, yeah. so there you go. That is that is Shannon and Laura's little uh, mutual admiration society for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we thank you all for joining us. As we, yeah, I know. Heart, heart, yeah. Um, as we celebrate our boy dogs and. Um, as always, if you have any questions about frozen and particularly international shipping, just drop Shannon an email. If you have any questions for me, Laura at puredogtalk.com. Bring it in, peeps. All right. Thanks, Shannon. Great to see you. Oh, my pleasure. Love you. Love you. Mwah.